Hi everyone um, and welcome to today's webinar from the Quality Network for Forensic Mental Health Services. My name is Kate Townsend and I'm the Programme Manager for this uh, Quality Network. So today's webinar is on technology. Um, so this is a hot topic that's been talked about a lot since COVID um, as services have had to work really hard to ensure that the systems in place are adequate to cope with the pressures of lockdown. We did an open discussion session on technology recently within the Quality Network um, and we heard all about the advancements, the advantages and the barriers of technology within forensic services. It was really interesting. And um, so we're hearing a lot about the impact it's having on patients, family and friends, allowing patients to have a tour within their loved one's house or even just having them more accessible for ad hoc calls as, as there's an increase in the number of devices available. Um, we're learning a lot about the uses of technology in innovative ways, such as the digital art workshops from hospital rooms um, and following on from that sort of the clinical advantages. Um, so things such as the increased engagement and attendance at CPA meetings and, and visual technology for remote consultations. So it really is sort of an exciting time. Um, so moving on to today's webinar, we're joined today um, by Dr. Robert Bates, who's a consultant forensic psychiatrist and clinical director, um, and Laura Cozens, who's a senior clinical manager. So they're both based at Broadmoor High Secure Hospital. They're going to share their first-hand experience on how to deliver technology at, a scale, at scale within forensic services, specifically talking about the non-contact monitoring system developed by OxyHealth. So we've got a few members of the OxyHealth team here behind the scenes as well, if there's any technological questions throughout. Um, just a few things to mention before I hand over. Um, this webinar is, is recorded, it's being recorded and will be made available at a future date. Um, although we can't, um, although we can't see you guys, see the audience at the moment, we really want to encourage participation and engagement throughout. So there's a Q&A function at the top right hand side of the screen, um, and uh, yeah, I really encourage you to ask as many questions throughout. We've got a section saved up towards the end of the webinar where we can ask Rob and Laura. Um, but that's it from me. So I'm going to pass you over to Robert Bates and Laura Cozens now. Okay then, uh, thanks very much. Hope you can hear us and see us okay. Um, this afternoon we're going to provide an overview of the introduction of a digital innovation, namely the Oxford Health Digital Care Assistant into Broadmoor Hospital. I think you've gone on mute. Sorry about that. Um, so we'll provide an introduction to the hospital, uh, the timeline of the introduction of the digital care assistant, discussion about the pilot phase, um, rolling it out, and also our experience to date. So, um, Broadmoor Hospital is part of West London NHS Trust. The hospital opened in 1863 and was the first high secure hospital in the UK. It covers London and the south of England and the catchment area of the hospital is approximately 23 million. The hospital provides care for men only with the National High Secure Service for Women being located at Rampton Hospital. We take men over the age of 18 and all our patients are detained under the Mental Health Act, and all our patients are assessed as pre presenting a grave risk of harm to others. Approximately two thirds of our patients have a primary diagnosis of mental illness, and approximately a third have a primary diagnosis of personality disorder, although the majority of our patients have comorbid illnesses. Our average length of stay is approximately five and a half years. The majority of the patients have committed serious offences, and approximately two thirds will come from prison and a third from medium security. This proportion flips on discharge with approximately a third being discharged to prison and two thirds to medium security. Rarely do we discharge patients directly into the community. Although we have a relatively young patient population with only three patients over the age of 60, there are high levels of physical morbidity, 
in particular obesity and diabetes. And our rates of diabetes run at about 25% of our, of our patient population. And one of the drivers for introducing the digital care system was to try and improve the physical health care that we um, provide to our patients. A number of you uh, may have visited the old Broadmoor Hospital, uh, much of which was Victorian and not fit for providing care in the 21st century. The new hospital, which was many years in the planning, um, finally opened in December of last year with the patients moving in in the first week of December. The new hospital allowed us to consider implementing new innovations at scale. The new hospital itself is um, 162 beds um, and we also use 48 beds from uh, the paddock centre which was built in 2004. We have 14 wards ranging in size between 12 and 19 patients and we have four different different types of wards, namely admission, increased support and, of assert and assertive treatment, intensive care and assertive rehabilitation. And the main differences between the wards really are the a level of support that we can provide um, for our patients. And we have two pathways, namely a mental illness pathway and a personality disorder pathway. Moving on to the timeline, um, West London NHS Trust um, started working with Oxy Health, uh, an Oxford based company uh, which developed the digital care assistant in 2014. Feasibility studies were carried out and the hospital was keen to work with Oxy Health to try and improve care for our patients and we thought this system could help us do that. Laura will speak in more detail regarding the technology, but it allows non-contact um, vital signs monitoring. A live study was carried out um, in 2017 in one of our empty seclusion rooms within the hospital to assess its efficacy. Um, the study involved um, patients and staff um, volunteering and demonstrated the validity of the technology. We then decided to move on to a pilot um, phase in 2018 and we introduced the system into four of our live seclusion rooms on one of our then high dependency wards. Um, we were so impressed by the system that a decision was taken in 2019 to introduce it into the new hospital and the system went live in June of this year. And I'll give further details regarding the decision to implement across the hospital later. And now I'll hand over to Laura to speak about the system in more detail. Hi, thanks Rob. Um, so the technology, so how does the technology work? So the technology is made up of a optical sensor, um, which is a camera and uh, infrared illumination, um, which is housed in a secure housing uh, in each of the rooms. Um, the technology um, is medically certified, uh, med a medical certified medical device um, which measures um, pulse and breathing rate, uh, non-contact. Um, what the system uh, allows is it alerts to high risk activity. Um, so in seclusion rooms, it will alert to uh, a non-activity. Um, so it will know that the room is occupied um, and it will alert to no activity within that room. Um, it's also uh, got the ability to alert if uh, a patient is spending uh, too long a time period inside a bathroom. Um, and in side rooms, um, it will produce activity reports. Um, and these activity reports will include data around how long patients are spending in bed, uh, how long they're spending in their rooms, how many bathroom visits, um, and how many times they've been in and out um, of side rooms. So this is a picture for you. So uh, the first picture there, you can see a close up of the secure housing. Uh, you can see the two infrared illuminators. 
and then you'll see half um, of the housing which has got uh, a black uh, screen over the top. Behind that screen um, is the camera. Um, we made the decision to put a screen in front of uh, the camera for, for various reasons really, um, especially for patients that may be um, slightly paranoid about seeing a camera. Um, we made it very clear to all of our patients what was in those housings, but we thought if they were actually able to see that constantly, that that may have a detrimental um, effect. And you'll see from the second photo that that is um, one of the side rooms in the new hospital. And you can see there where the housing sits up in the corner um, uh, of the room between the uh, wall and ceiling. So um, how staff use the system. <clears throat> so there is a fixed screen in the nursing office. Um, which is positioned um, where you can only see the screen when you're in the nursing office. Um, and we also have two portable tablet devices, um, which we use one of them for during the day and then one of them at night to allow charging times. Um, and I, one of these tablets will always be out um, on the ward um, to be used. Um, for our seclusion rooms, our seclusion rooms are, uh, are off of the ward uh, and outside each seclusion room, uh, they have their individual screen outside of each of those rooms. Um, it's designed with patient privacy and dignity in mind uh, and also uh, ease of use as well. You'll see from the picture on the screen, this is what the screen in the nursing station and the portable tablet device will look like. So you can see each uh, room is divided into a individual tablet. Um, and you'll see that if you look at room one, it will tell you that that patient is currently in bed. Uh, and room two is a lighter shade of green and tells you that that patient is in the room, but they're not um, in bed. To the previous screen that I was talking about in relation to sort of high risk activity, um, it, it will also tell you when a patient is in the bathroom. Um, and that will, the, the tablet on the screen will come up orange and it will identify as a blind spot. Um, and that's uh, in relation to privacy and dignity of patients using um, the en suites. Um, we also, in the early stages, uh, when we were using it in the four seclusion rooms, uh, we had a few patients that would also um, cover up the housing in the room. Um, and therefore, um, we had a conversation with Oxy Health about developing another tablet to say that the sensor had been interfered with. So again, that alerts staff that they need to go in and have a look, and it may be that that's been covered up. So um, our initial experiences uh, from both the validation study and the pilot study was very positive. Uh, the f main findings were that patients reported feeling safer, particularly with respect to their physical health care. Um, for example, a patient who had had an admission to the general hospital requested to be placed in that room when he returned as he felt safer and he didn't want staff coming in and doing observations. Um, post rapid tranquilization um, when it can be sometimes quite difficult um, to, to go into the room after that, either because of risk or because the patients um, are refusing physical observations. I'm also used if, uh, for example, a patient had had to be um, restrained and allowed us to check up on them remotely. It um, also um, allowed a faster response time to a serious um, physical health patient um, incident. Um, and um, it picks up, it can pick up the deteriorating patient more quickly. Uh, patients themselves reported feeling less disturbed during nighttime observations. 
and other organisations which were piloting it had similar findings and also noted that the system informed understanding, for example, sleep quality and unusual um, behaviour patterns. And I know in some um, in some services where it was being used for more elderly patients, it helped with things like falls. So following the pilot stage, we had to come to a decision as to whether or not to expand it more widely in the hospital. We felt that there were four areas which made the value case. Um, firstly, firstly, with respect to patient safety, we felt the system would be a, able to identify earlier warning signs to physical health deterioration and also potentially self-harm, violence and aggression and contraband use. We also, as I said, felt that it improved monitoring post interventions. Secondly, with respect to patient experience, patients would no longer be disturbed at night during observations and as such it would have a positive impact on sleep, which would have a further positive impact on daytime activity and well-being. And also that patients would feel reassured and safer and have a greater sense of privacy. Thirdly, with respect to staff, staff will be able to carry out more accurate nighttime observations and observations would be carried out more rapidly. One of the big uh, difficulties and what sort of our nursing staff told us was really that doing the observations, at, particularly at night when it's darker, it's really difficult to actually see into uh, a patient's bedroom and to actually see whether the patient is moving or breathing. And often as not, the staff were having to turn the lights on to see or shine a torch to see, you know, patient patient movement. And that for some of our patients was waking them regularly. Um, staff felt they'd be able to intervene more quickly in em medical emergencies. It would improve physical health monitoring. Staff would feel more reassured regarding regarding patient welfare. And the data from the system will be able to inform clinical decisions. For example, um, giving an accurate recording of how some how long somebody is sleeping, whether, for example, the, med the medication is too sedating. Um, and also the date of the system would provide data for serious incident reviews to help us better understand how to improve care after the fact. Fourthly, we also felt that the system would become more capable over time and enable us to do other things, for example, um, helping us diagnose sleep apnea um, in patients. Um, so uh, the SMT, our senior management team in 2019, supported the introduction of the system and a decision was made to install it in all the bedrooms in the new hospital and seclusion rooms. So the 162 bedrooms and the uh, about 16 uh, seclusion rooms. We also have a plan to introduce it into the paddock centre when that is uh, refurbished. That was due to start in April of this year, but because of um, the pandemic, that has to be, has had to be delayed a bit, but we still intend to install it in there. Thanks, Rob. <clears throat> so, um, as Rob said, the decision was made to install into the new hospital. Um, when that decision was made, the, um, all the wards were built uh, and it wasn't far away from the anticipated patient move date. Um, however, um, once the decision was made, uh, the installation started, um, it was relatively painless. Um, and although it wasn't initially planned into the new build, um, it, uh, th there was no major issues. And I think if you go back to the original photo that I had shown of the system in the side room, it doesn't look like it should never have been there. It looks like it was all part of the build. Um, and I think the system's versatile to the built environment. So our side rooms and our seclusion rooms are different sizes, different shapes, um, and it was versatile to be able to fit both of those rooms. Um, there was no issues around uh, information governance um, and the time scale. Um, it was fast to implement and it didn't hold up um, any of the patient moves. 
and I suppose just to add about the information governance, I mean, one of our main things was, you know, ensuring patient dignity and privacy um, and also security over patient information. So one of the main things for us has been to ensure that no patient identifiable information leaves the hospital, either in a cloud or virtually or in, in any way, so that um, most of the information um, is sort of kept as non-identifiable code, but the system does take live, um, live images, uh, which are only kept for a short period of time, and none of those live images ever leave the secure server within the hospital. Okay, um, so moving on to patient engagement. Um, as Rob said at the beginning, um, when we first started working with Oxy Health, um, patients were involved in the initial pilot right uh, in the very beginning, um, as were staff. When the decision was made to uh, upscale uh, into the rest, into the new hospital, um, there was various discussions about how we um, how we share this information with patients. Um, we have a monthly patient forum um, in which uh, every ward in the hospital has a representative that goes to the forum. Um, so information was initially shared there. Um, I then made the decision to uh, hold individual focus groups um, with some of the patient ward representatives um, about being able to answer more questions, provide them with more information. Um, we also, every ward in the hospital has a weekly community meeting, um, so it became a standing agenda item for the community meetings, so ward managers um, every week it would be discussed. Um, and sometimes that involved myself and or Rob as well attending those meetings um, to be able to answer some of the questions that maybe the ward managers weren't able to answer. We also developed um, with Oxy Health um, patient leaflets uh, and a DVD as well, which again was shown at community meetings and every ward holds that DVD um, so patients can watch it when they want to watch it. And it's a very short DVD. Um, it goes through the system, how it works, uh, what staff see on the tablet when they're taking uh, the vital signs. Um, and I think the most important thing, and I think I touched on the subject, was about being open and honest and transparent with our patients. So um, making it very clear to them why this technology was coming in and the benefits uh, of it for the patients. Um, I think learning from what we did, I think the DVD worked extremely well um, and there were a number of patients that didn't just watch it once, they watched it a few times. However, the feedback from the patients from the DVD um, was that they would have liked somebody talking through the slides rather than it just being a rolling slideshow for them. So that's one thing uh, that we learnt. Um, and I think on the whole, um, the patient experience was uh, has been successful. Um, however, I think there are certain uh, we had certain wards um, which was uh, dependent on diagnosis, um, where those patients needed um, more time and more engagement from both myself and Rob in relation to the system. Um, and that was things like uh, being present on the ward, showing them the tablet. Uh, uh, they volunteered for each other to go into the side rooms so they could look at the tablet and exactly see what staff were viewing um, when they were taking the observations. Um, and also one of their concerns was um, how that picture looked at night as well, um, when the rooms were darker. So that involved, again, ourselves coming in and having uh, more engagement with certain patients. 
Um, so then moving on to the staff engagement, um, again, staff were involved um, right back at the start of this journey with Oxy Health. Um, so again, it was discussed at staff and clinical team meetings. Um, we had uh, ward champions, so every ward had uh, three champions um, that would be uh, that would help other staff on the ward in relation to training and things like that. Um, we did individual ward training drop in sessions. Um, and I think one of the things that we were very lucky to have was we had obviously moved then and the four seclusion rooms that we had the technology in are on our decamp wards. So we had the system um, installed in those seclusion rooms. So staff attending the drop in sessions for training were actually able to use the system live um, and uh, have that experience. Um, that was very useful and the feedback from the staff found they found that very, very helpful. Um, and I think moving forward, our plan is to have uh, monthly managers meetings moving forward, allowing wards to explore the system to support their needs. Um, and that's something that we're going to set up from September, October, um, moving forward now that we're live um, across the whole site. Um, some of the feedback from the staff uh, at the beginning, um, they had raised concerns in relation to how implementing this technology would affect them, um, which to start with, um, I, I wasn't entirely sure um, why they were concerned. Um, but having more conversations with them, it was uh, they felt that we would start reducing staffing numbers um, because we had technology this technology now that was able to do that they thought this was one of the ways um, that we would then start reducing our staffing numbers um, so there was a lot of work that happened uh, around reassuring staff um, and supporting them that that wasn't going to happen um, and this this hasn't happened So um, just moving on to a couple of um, case studies that have happened uh, and where the, system, the technology has been um, vital in, in helping us. So um, this was from one of our uh, ISAT wards. So we've got a young man with a diagnosis of schizophrenia, uh, complex and treatment resistant. Um, who regularly isolates himself. Um, he spends long periods of time um, in his side room. The only time he'll come out of his side room is with um, uh, staff support. Uh, and that would be for things like using the laundry room um, or um, going to the garden. Um, there had been some physical interventions um, with this man. So uh, going in and giving him his medication because he wouldn't come out of his room to attend the medication room. Um, which often resulted in um, uh, injuries to staff. Um, he also struggles to communicate with staff um, about one, how he's feeling in relation to his mental health, um, but also to his physical health. Um, and uh, what the ward uh, clinical team had decided was the activity reports that the system is able to produce. Uh, they reviewed those uh, on a weekly basis within their ward rounds. And they noticed that this particular patient um, on one night, there had been over 30. sheets which on this particular ward are done every 15 minutes um, and there was only a handful of times had that been picked up on the general observation sheets that at that point in time um, the patient had been in the bathroom 
Um, obviously, those general observations are only as good as that five or 10 seconds of, of you looking through. Um, however, with the activity report from um, Oxy Health, we were able to see um, that he had visited the bathroom over 30 times. Um, therefore, there was a suspected UTI. Uh, staff uh, and the ward doctors were able to have a conversation with this patient uh, and collected a urine sample, which confirmed uh, that he did have a UTI. Um, also, in relation to um, post rapid tranquilization, um, obviously the standards are post uh, RT that uh, every 15 minutes for at least an hour uh, following it, that vital signs um, should be taken uh, and monitored. Um, however, um, given if given that you've had to give some of our patients RT, it's unlikely that patients uh, are going to uh, comply and agree to have physical observations um, following this. Um, and therefore, if you're having to go into a room and possibly uh, get involved in a physical intervention with the patient to be able to get these uh, observations, um, it's it's slightly pointless because of the um, uh, the the intervention that you've had to go through, um, and also it's it's increasing risk to both staff um, and patient as well. Um, therefore, with the technology in place, it will enable us to monitor pulse and breathing rate. Um, and obviously constantly assessing about whether we can enter that room and we have got the compliance from the patient to take a full set of vital signs. Um, and going on to nighttime observations, um, as Rob has said, uh, they can be uh, obtrusive. Um, so turning lights on to be able to see patients, uh, the noise of, so our observation panels in the side room doors, um, you need to um, use your key to be able to, uh, so they opaque, the patients can opaque them from the inside for us to be able to see through. Um, and the feedback from patients was actually uh, by turning lights on and the noise of keys outside, um, it does wake people up. Um, and as any one of us, it's, it's, it's not very pleasant to be woken up during the night. Um, so the important, it's the importance of sleep hygiene, um, which then has a knock on effect of the quality of life. Um, so um, it enabled staff to be able to, um, to, when they go around to do their observations, rather than having to turn a light on or, as Rob said, to shine a torch through, um, they were able to use the tablet as they walked around to get the assurance uh, that that patient was all right. Um, we've also had uh, patients that will block observation uh, panels um, and in the past before we had the technology in place as soon as a patient had blocked an observation panel um, we would have, we would have had to have opened the door we would have had to have gone in um, which uh, can put staff and patients at risk. Uh, however, now that we've got the technology, we're able to use that to check that everything is OK um, in that room, therefore reducing risk to staff and patients. So uh, using the data uh, to support medical and nursing interventions, uh, as I had said uh, at the beginning and the uh, example of the patient with a UTI, um, our MDT uh, are weekly, have a weekly meeting um, and they're reviewing these activity reports uh, on a weekly basis. Um, we're not also as well as reviewing it uh, as an MDT, we're using these activity reports to review with patients as well um, and using them to inform care planning, 
Um, so being able to provide this data to patients about what our concerns are and, and showing them what we're seeing. Um, I think also it cuts, uh, so for our patients that are on long term segregation, um, we're able to use the activity reports to provide accurate data uh, in relation to association times. Um, and I think it, it cuts out reliance on human error. Um, so quite often our association times uh, what was being reported we knew wasn't accurate but it was because staff hadn't filled the paperwork out however now that we've got these activity reports we've got the data there um, I think in relation to sort of nursing interventions as well, I was talking to one of the nurses on one of the wards who uh, is a primary nurse to a patient on long term segregation, um, who he regularly isolates himself in his room. However, when you talk to him, uh, that's not his that's not his view. Um, he doesn't think that that's what happens. Um, so the nurse was able to use the activity report with the patient uh, and to show him how many uh, how long uh, over the last seven days he had spent in his room. Um, and also then uh, the nurse was able to put an intervention into place and had agreed with the patient that they would review the data the following week to see whether that intervention had made any difference uh, in him spending time out of his room. So I think um, the patient experience today, uh, the general feeling is that patients feel safer. Um, However, I think we need to continually support patients who may have issues with the technology. Um, so again, going back to, um, uh, we, I think we recognise that some of our patients will feel paranoid when it comes to uh, a camera being in their room. Um, however, I think it's how we continue to communicate with them and continue to work with them um, moving forward. Um, I think uh, as well we've had positive experience of um, following rapid tranquilization, where before we may not have got uh, any, uh, may not have been able to monitor vital signs. However, with the technology in place, um, we are able to monitor pulse um, and breathing rate. Uh, and the general feeling from the majority of patients is that quality of sleep has improved as well. Um, and that's in respect to, as I'd said earlier, about lights not being turned on or torches shine through the observation panels. Um, and um, I suppose it's just moving on just to say thank you uh, for everyone who's listening um, and acknowledging the relationship we've got with Oxy Health um, and uh, how responsive and timely they've been, um, especially with some of my requests for uh, data at very short notice. Um, and just saying thank you to all the patients and staff in Broadmoor Hospital. Thank you. Um, happy to try and answer any questions <laughs> or hand them over to uh, the Oxy Health team. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Um, um, yeah, we've actually had quite a few questions come through. Um, so I'll just go from the top. Um, OK, so first question was, how has the impact on the recording of your meaningful activity data and does this run alongside the 24, 25 hour data 24 hour data? Um, I suppose we haven't really had a chance to test that out yet um, because of the pandemic. We took a decision in uh, towards the end of March to stop recording our 25 hours activity, not not providing it, but um, actually recording it. So we have restarted recording our patient activity this month. So it is something we absolutely will be looking at, particularly with sort of association times and getting out of the room. Um, but yeah, but we haven't had chance yet. And just to add into that, I've got a meeting tomorrow to have the discussion around how we use the data from the technology in relation to our association times for our long term segregation patients. 
Superb, thank you. Um, so the next question is, are you using EOBS and is the system, uh, or does the system have an interface with the Oxy Health system? Um, so with regards to electronic observations, currently we're still using paper. Um, we have a separate um, recording device for patient activity, which we um, introduced about 18 months to two years ago now, and that was in response to um, criticisms against the hospital uh, with respect to activity, and we felt that a lot of the problem was recording. So we moved to um, recording patient activity on tablets, and the next project with regards to that is to move our observations onto that. Now, I'm not sure yet at the moment whether we'll be able to link them up. We know that the observations will be able to link up directly with our patient record system, which for us is Rio, but I'm unsure yet about whether we can link it up with the Oxy Health. Lovely, thank you. Um, so we've got another question here about, did you see a reduction in the use of restrictive interventions? And the next one is it's a relatively similar one. So have, have you seen a reduction in, in technical, in the, sorry, have you have observation levels been reduced with the technical innovations? So yeah, I guess it's about restrictive interventions, first of all. Um, so I think it's a bit early to say whether it has an impact on restrictive inter interventions. Mm. I think what it might have an impact, which I think what the second question was trying to get at, will it affect for some of our patients whether we need to have them on, for example, constant observations or not. I think it will do where we're concerned about physical health. I don't think it will necessarily if the concern mm -hmm. is about harm to self. Although there's some early looking at it, there may be some sort of changes, physiological changes for individuals if prior to self, prior to them harming themselves, which we may be able to use as a, at a later date and use as a sort of alarm system. But at the moment we could, we would look to, with some patients, if it's around physical care, reduce the number of times the member of um, the ward staff is going to see the patient. Um, what it has in a sort of opposite way around is highlighted to us if somebody's spending a long time in a bathroom. Yeah. So for some of our patients, you know, that's fine. They have long showers in the morning. We're not concerned yeah. about that. But if some, for example, um, if a patient's spending a lot of time in their bathroom at night, then that can highlight us to the fact that that patient may be distressed or potentially uh, thinking of harming themselves. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that sort of leads me on to the next question, um, which is about does it does the system alert you if there are multiple people in one bathroom or, or bedroom even? So, um, yeah, the system uh, will or can alert to multiple room entry. Um, we made the decision uh, not to have that alert here. Um, as that's something that we haven't had an issue with. Um, but yes, the system can alert to multiple room entry. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and throughout your presentation, you mentioned about governance, um, but one of the questions here is about how did you manage the governance around consent? Go on. Go on. Um, so I suppose, um, so because we're not utilising the information for, for third parties, um, we didn't specifically uh, get anybody uh, get consent for us to put the um, to put the uh, into put the uh, technology into the patients' bedrooms. So we didn't formally request consent from every patient with regards to this. OK, and so do you we have CCTV um, everywhere as well on all the wards, um, so. And also we use body worn cameras yeah. as well, which also we don't. Uh, I mean, we took the view because we're not using the information outside uh, and no patient identifiable information could transmit outside of the hospital. Mm -hmm. And so can patients opt out to have the Oxy, Oxy Health system on? 
Maybe they could, but nobody has opted out. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so we've got another question, another couple of questions through. So in the event of an incident, would the data be admissible in court? Um, I think that's a good question. It, it is a medical registered medical device. So from that point of view, I suspect it would be. Um, but uh, fortunately, uh, we haven't had um, we haven't had to use it in sort of a criminal or civil court. No. Anything? No. no, I don't. Okay. Thank you. Um, so another question here has uh, someone said, "Have you? Um, how have you ensured staff and patients don't feel like Big Brother is watching them?" So how did the message? I mean, how did you message that with the, with the staff and patients? I mean, I think that, um, and I'll hand over to Laura this, but I think it's really around the patient engagement yeah. at the start and before the system went live. Um, explaining to the patients as well. So before the patients moved into the new hospital, we informed them about the system that was going to be there, not that it was live at that point. I wrote to all the patients, we went round to all the community meetings, um, and then we did that again when we moved um, into the new hospital before the system um, went live, explaining what the system was for, how the system works, what the data is used for, um, so I think it isn't to say that there aren't any patients who still feel a bit that it is, as you say, sort of big brother. Um, but uh, I think it was through that engagement really that got most of the patients on side. Yeah, um, definitely what Rob has said, the, um, the engagement and the work that we did uh, with patients and staff. Um, I think also, um, obviously, some of our our patients stay with us for. Robert said the um, length of stay on average is sort of five and a half years. So we have a lot of patients also that were involved in the pilot scheme um, right at the beginning in the early days, um, and we also had um, so some of the examples that I had given you in relation to uh, rapid trank and medical emergencies that we had had that. Um, patients were able to see from sort of those incidents and talking to each other um, about the benefits of the system as well. Thank you and that sort of leads me nice on to the next question which was about how have you involved carers in the decision making process? Um, so I, um, we have a carers meeting um, as well. Um, so I believe it was discussed at the carers forum um, and they were informed about the technology, about how it works, about why, uh, and again, uh, what our view was. Um, and as far as I'm aware, there was no uh, other feedback from any carers that had attended that concerns raised. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question here about costing, but I'm aware that you aren't going to be discussing costing specifically about Broadmoor, and I just want to direct that person, whoever it is, um, to, yeah, to, to, to um, contact Oxy Health directly, and we can we can share some email addresses if that's helpful. Um, but as it's anonymous, I'm not quite sure who who sent that message. But I'm happy to to direct you if you can message me directly. Um, so next question on the list uh, is about quality, quality and patient safety accepted. Could your benefits uh, realisation help other trusts to persuade their financial and risk committees to support investment decisions where they are nervous about capital spend? Um, yeah, I mean, I think particularly for sort of from the value case, I mean, that's how I suppose it got through our um, why it was supported by our senior management team. Uh, now, if, if that person wants to email me directly, I can provide some information about that, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so this question might be slightly more directed to the Oxy Health team, but has, has the system been tested in secure female services? And is there any information on this? 
Uh, yeah, I can answer that. So we are working in the in early stages, but working with uh, with Rampton and their female secure service. Great. I guess if it's in early stages, I think it's just about sharing information and perhaps we could do that via Knowledge Hub or some other platform. Yep. Um, OK, and so is there any evidence to support how this techno technology has helped to reduce self-harming behaviours? Um, I suppose at the moment, no, is the, is, is the answer. Um, I think we've only, it's only been up and running for a relatively brief period of time. Yeah. Um, I think sort of when it was in the pilot phase, um, because of where it was, the patients were on constant observations anyway, because of where our seclusion rooms were situated in the paddock centre. So as of yet, it hasn't, but I think highlighting before it does highlight things like if somebody's spending a long time in the bedroom, uh, sorry, in the in the bathroom, um, particularly active, for example, more agitated than normal, you know, out of bed a lot of the time. Mm. So we are, we do suspect that it will do, but we, we haven't got any sort of definitive evidence of that yet. Yeah, and I, I can add to that. There's a, a webinar that um, Dr. Ender Bewley from mm. Coventry and Warwickshire Trust did in July with the Royal College of Psychiatrists PICU Quality Network. And there she shared the data from their clinical study in acute and PICU wards. Um, so not the secure services, but they found a 22% reduction in self-harm incidents in the bedroom including a 66% reduction in ligatures in the bathroom area. Absolutely, and that webinar is available on the website as well, so I'm happy to send that around afterwards if that's helpful to everyone. Um, so another question is about how you strike a balance between actively getting people up and people remaining within their rooms and reducing interventions or injuries. Um, I think that is, um, that can be quite difficult. So uh, for some of our patients, they self isolate themselves in their room. And for another of our patients, it's managing their time out of their room because of the risk they present to others. Um, we don't sort of, if somebody's isolating themselves in their room, we don't go into sort of force, force patients yeah. um, out of their room and wouldn't do that. But it is about trying to build up um, rapport with them, the nursing staff do a very good job of building sort of um, close relationship, professional relationships with our patients mm, to try and mm. try and try and encourage them. But I think, you know, as with all services, that can be can be very difficult. Laura? Yeah, um, no, I don't think there's anything I'd add to that. Um, so, yeah, as Rob said, we don't we're not going to force people out of their room, but I suppose it's about building that relationship up and finding out why um, they're spending that amount of time in their room. Um, and, and, and that could be quite an easy fix. Just I'm just thinking off the top of my head. We had a patient who, again, would spend long periods of time in his room but um, when it was discussed with him about why this was happening, um, it was to do with what activities he was being offered. So it, it was something that was sort of relatively simple to, um, yeah, to try and a little bit more planning was involved um, and then uh, increasing that time out for him. Um, yeah. I mean, we're fortunate to be able to provide a lot of activities yeah. um, within, within the hospital. Uh, so there are a wide variety of things that uh, patients can do both on the ward and, uh, and and off the ward to try and encourage them. And often also it's about uh, looking at their at their treatment um, and to see whether we can optimise that really. Great, thank you. Um, another question that's come through is about uh, what have staff been doing with the release time the system gives them? So how do you ensure that staff are not sitting and looking at the monitors rather than seeing the patients? So um, so we've ensured that, for example, when observations that although they they will be able to use the um, device to see 
you know, to check patients' um, breathing and, and pulse rate. Um, with we are still ensuring that they are going round every half an hour, every fifteen minutes, depending on which yeah. ward they are, so that they are physically seeing the patients yeah. um, as well as using the Oxy Health. Um, we felt, I mean, that is something that we were worried about. Would staff just want to? Perhaps some staff sit in the office and not not be out on the floor. But this is about improving care as opposed to replacing staff. Yeah. So our thoughts haven't been really about about reducing numbers of staff. It's about being able to do those things quicker so that they can be engaging with patients um, more. Yeah. Anything to add to that? Norma? No, nothing no. else. Thank you. Um, and so a couple of final questions. Are any lessons learned so far um, from this use of technology after some near misses or any serious incidents? Any lessons learned that you can share? Um, I mean, I suppose with one serious incident, it was able to alert us quickly to that so that we could respond quickly to it and I think if we hadn't had the system in place it would have taken um, us longer to respond to that yeah. and that was a, a an, an acute health uh, a sorry to a medical medical emergency yeah. so that was uh, there was one thing I mean some of the sort of case um, examples uh, Laura has given I think it's it has been helpful particularly when patients have blocked their uh, block their observation window so that we we can't see in and previously where we may have just had to go in yeah. because we didn't know what was happening it's allowed us to prepare the a proper team yeah. to safely go in so that we protect both the patient um, and also also our staff I think there are lessons learned with regards to the implementation so for example around the dvd mm -hmm. that was that was an example and i don't think you can ever give too much information prior to prior to introducing something so i think for a couple of the wards well one ward in particular mm -hmm. i think in hindsight we perhaps should have provided more information information to uh, we have subsequently done that but we should have done it yeah. done it before yeah um i think that for me they'd be the main so far yeah i think that's really helpful thank you um another question that's come through i'm, I'm aware of time so we'll only be able to do what sort of one or two more questions but um has it been used to assist in patient discharges or well, i guess transfers as well um not really for us no not yet Okay. Um, and to what degree has this initiative been supported by clinicians, including the wider MDT? Um, clinicians, sorry, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. it's been it's been fully supported actually. Um, other than a few concerns expressed by some ward-based staff, which Laura mentioned earlier, I I haven't had any concerns expressed by any of the other sort of clinical groups or by or by senior managers either. No, it has been thus far viewed positively. I mean, I think part of that is the fact that the hospitals had a relation, the trust has had a relationship with Oxy Health now for a number of years, and we put a lot of time, as did Oxy Health, into the sort of feasibility study, and then a lot of time went into the pilot study as well. So the organisation has been used to working with Oxy Health, and I think that's helped that it's been a sort of for us it's helped by being a sort of slow drip and build up as opposed to sort of one day it's here and one day it's one day it's not here and one day it's yeah. here um but yeah no I think I think everybody has been positive thus far and is really wanting to start to you know to really start using it and understand how we can best use it to help help our patient care yeah Fantastic. I think that's a really good point to leave on. 
Um, so I just really want to thank both uh, Laura and Robert for, for doing the presentation um, and sharing their experiences of using the technology and also to Oxy Health as well, um, who are great supports in the background. Um, and I hope everyone who's listening has enjoyed it and learned a lot. Um, there's probably a few questions that we didn't manage to get through, so I'll definitely try and get those answered um, and replied after the webinar. Um, and as I mentioned, this is going to be made available on our website. Um, shortly it won't go on immediately i think we're waiting on on some um media publicity or has that already happened that's already happened that's fine fab okay so we'll get we'll get this on the website relatively quickly then um and yeah just to just to shout out as well that we've got an annual forum coming up on the 30th of september and um, so we can send you links if anyone's interested in joining that that's a full day program um, but yeah thank you very much everyone for, for joining and i hope you've enjoyed it all right. Thanks. Bye Sorry. now. Thank you. Bye.